Hi everybody, welcome to yet another new episode of the vlog. Uh, this is episode two of my delve into the amazing uh, and amazingly versatile uh, singing career of the great Linda Ronstadt. Uh, in the first episode of this series, which I will link to in the description, I talked about her development as an artist over on Capitol Records and the first few albums she made over there. Today I'm going to go into uh, where she really got artistic control um, over at Asylum Records, a label that was run by David Geffen, uh, founded in 1972. Famously, he signed the Eagles and I believe Jackson Brown pretty early on. And then Linda was another one of his main uh, signings in 1973. She puts out her first album for Asylum called Don't Cry Now. Like I mentioned in the last video, she then went back to Capitol to record Heart Like a Wheel and then was back at Asylum. Her first few records for Asylum were all pretty straightforward country rock albums. Nothing wrong with that. This is considered her classic period, and these are all amazing albums. But uh, it's not really till the 80s that she really shows off the true range of genres she can do. But lots of great albums came out of the 70s on uh, Asylum for her, like Prisoner in Disguise and uh, Hasten Down the Wind, of course. Uh, my personal favorite studio album of hers, uh, Simple Dreams, although I also really like the album Mad Love that we'll get to. And then I also have um, The Great Living in the USA. A lot of people had this poster up on their wall. Um, I also have up there on the record frame, that's an original picture disc version of that album from 1978. Very cool. Um, and then, yeah, we get into the 80s. Uh, it all starts with... Mad Love, which comes out in 1980 and shows her being just a little harder edged doing, uh, well, it's certainly not punk, but it's as close to it as she would get. A kind of new wavy, again, not really new wave, but as close as she would really get to it. I love this album. And when I was reading through uh, Linda's autobiography, uh, Simple Dreams, great book, by the way, highly recommend it. I was kind of sad that she sort of glosses over this period in her career as just being a time when she was selling out bigger and bigger arenas, which is very good from a financial perspective, but uh, she considered it very limiting from an artistic perspective because she would say, I think the, uh, the what she said was you could still hear uh, Led Zeppelin's power chords reverberating around the arena from the night before. And that she said it's hard to get a point across to an audience in such a cavernous building. And she was talking about how her music was just getting louder and louder and louder to compensate for it. And uh, that after Mad Love, she knew she needed to make a change. And that did make me sad because I freaking love this record. But make a change she did. One of the first things she did was go into the world of musical theater. She was in a fairly short production, uh, short run that is. Uh, of La Boheme, of all things. Can you imagine going from uh, singing pop rock music to La Boheme? I mean, as far as operas go, that's a pretty challenging one. Yeah, it was not reviewed particularly well. It was, I don't think there's a lot of recordings. I'll have to check to see if there's a cast recording of that. If anybody knows of one, please let me know in the comments. That would be great. Um, but uh, what she did do after that was a great production of The Pirates of Penzance, um, alongside Kevin Klein and Rex Smith, and they did, I believe, a Broadway run from 1981 through 82, and then in 83 it was made into a movie. I'm not sure. I think it may have been a straight-to-TV movie. I don't know if it was in theaters. That's another thing you could let me know in the comments, but it's great. I actually had to order this soundtrack online because I'd never successfully found it in a record store. And weirdly enough, I think this may have been my introduction to Linda Ronstadt. Um, I was in a, a little small town production of Pirates of Penzance myself, and we all watched this movie as a cast. She does a great job, and so do uh, Rex Smith and uh, Kevin Klein, Estelle Parsons. It's just a great um, cast recording. You should really pick that up. Then she comes back to the world of sort of country slash rock slash pop with Get Closer. 1982. I believe this only has a few new recordings, new at the time in 1982, and also has a lot of um, songs from like the Simple Dream sessions or from the Living in the USA sessions 
that were not used and they came out. As far as her albums go, this is not my personal favorite, but hey, all of her albums are pretty much good. Um, then she decided she wanted to sing some old school jazz, some traditional pop stuff. And she talks about in her record label how every time she wanted to reinvent herself and sing a new genre, she would always have to have a whole fight with the record label. Now, like I said, Asylum was sort of built on the concept of giving creative freedoms to their artists, but uh, at the same time, um, they saw a country rock artist saying, I'm going to record a traditional pop jazz album. And they were like... People aren't going to buy that. They know you as a country rock girl. They're not going to buy your jazz album. But Linda would always have the last laugh because they would always buy these albums. These uh, Her records always sold and Get Closer is no exception. Big seller. Uh, she says in her book that she told her record label she wants somebody like Nelson Riddle to arrange the music uh, for the record. And they say, well... And let's call Nelson Riddle. And I think, frankly, she was not aware that he was still around, but he absolutely was. He didn't know who Linda was. And I, I think he told his kids, so the story goes. He tells his kids, some girl named Linda Ronstadt wants to work with me. And they were like, you have to say yes. You have to take this on. This is going to be awesome. So he did. And uh, she records three albums with him that all come out in the mid-1980s. The second one is Lush Life not really on topic for this video but i have to show you this picture because linda ronstadt as a flapper girl is pretty much the cutest thing i've ever seen anyway that's neither here nor there uh she also puts out an album in 1986 with nelson riddle called uh for sentimental reasons i don't have a copy of that one i'd like to get one i'd also love to have uh, i forget what it's called but they put out a box set of all three of the albums and i think it may have had bonus track anyway uh, Nelson Riddle actually passed away in, I believe, 1985, and uh, for sentimental reasons was actually a posthumous release for him, unfortunately. And then Linda did a whole bunch of other projects in 1987, covering a whole bunch of ground. First of all, she made the album that she had been wanting to make and trying to make for the last decade, getting in with her friends Dolly Parton and Emmy Lou Harris and making the Trio album. It was a long time coming. I think they started work on a possible trio project, like I said, 10 years earlier in 1977. Uh, they did some TV appearances back in the 70s as well, and just the best of friends. They apparently had a great time making this album. It shows it's a great album. I love all three of them as singers, so just a great album. And then she also revisited her, revisited her roots, excuse me, um, in making the Spanish language album, Canciones de Mi Padre. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this album in America is the number one selling non-English release. So I believe, yeah, this is the highest selling non-English language album in American history, I believe. And again, she had to have a whole fight with uh, uh, Asylum Records, which was now Warner. I think Warner had bought out Asylum by this point. Or no, it's still on the Asylum brand. But... Actually, Warner always distributed Asylum. What am I talking about? Anyway, yes, she uh, put a lot of her heart and soul into this album. And I was not really, as much as I enjoy everything Linda Rossett ever does, I was not particularly expecting to enjoy that album. And I was, I was proven wrong. It, it's a great record. And it's the first of a series of three um, albums she would do in that style as well. She also made um, as Canciones, sorry, I'm terrible at pronouncing these things, and also Frenesi, again, sorry about the pronunciation if that's wrong. So yeah, now she's got a, tri a, a trilogy of jazz albums, a, a trilogy of Spanish albums, um, still working. In 1989, she, in between the Spanish language albums, she starts to work with another person she really admires, Mr. Aaron Neville, and they make the classic Cry Like a Rainstorm, Howl Like the Wind um, LP with its massive uh, monster hit, uh, Don't Know Much, which still gets played all the time. I heard it in the shopping mall the other day. And through the 90s and 2000s, she continues to record, continues to uh, change her styles through the years. She uh, makes more traditional pop records. She makes, I think, a couple more 
country pop albums. Yes, she recorded a couple more country rock albums, including I've heard really good things about We Ran and and Winter Light, and I just gotta listen to those records. I've heard they're great. I think she released an album of music for children at some point, and continues to record new music till the late 2000s, uh, performs her final concerts in 2009, and has of course since retired and been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. But even through that, she's done some really great work. Uh, most notably, I mean, this past year, she put out the amazing documentary Linda and the Mockingbirds about her trip to Mexico with Jackson Brown, actually, I think, goes with her. And um, they go visit this singing group down in Mexico. Anyway, I've done a whole review on that movie. I loved it so much. And I think I'll link to that in the description as well. Uh, she covered so many genres. She basically did what she wanted. She basically would, she would fight to get her way and record the music that she wanted to. And eventually, uh, the record labels had to sort of realize she can really sell anything. Because the record labels getting annoyed with her for changing up her style, I mean, they weren't without precedent. I mean, usually if an artist records something in a totally different genre out of left field, usually it's hard to get that record to sell. But Linda's voice is just so amazing and so adaptable to so many different genres that people just love whatever she does, myself included, if you haven't been able to tell from these videos. I'm probably going to do a full-scale... Um, like biography series on her someday this was more just to cover uh all the directions she went with her career um because i just think it's fascinating i really don't think that anybody else was able to cover so many genres uh so successfully as her but if you know someone else who did that quite well again let me know in the comments that would be cool thank you so much for watching that'll do it for this episode uh, check out the description for links to where you can find my own music. I write and uh, put out some music myself. Uh, and um, there's yeah links in there to where you can find all my social media and stuff as well. Like this video if you like what you saw. Subscribe to my channel if you've been enjoying my videos. And you can also ring the notification bell if you want to be notified whenever I upload a new video. Uh, thanks so much for watching. And once, as always, I'll catch you guys again real soon.